So the message is to be strong in the Lord. And I think whether we are young people or we are adults, this is what God wants of us. Amen? And this morning I'm going to use the Bible version. Actually, I'm using both the New Living Translation and the message. But that's the message that, I, that is on my heart. And why I, I want to do that, because personally, and probably most of you also like to do this, I like to look at many Bible versions, because it opens our mind, and it helps us to, to see differently, think differently. Oh, I didn't see it in that, in that angle, and all of this. I like to study older, like precise, word-by-word -word translation, but I like sometimes to expand uh, amplify the message uh, or, or the easy reading of the New Living Translation and it, it enlightens us. And I really like the text of the message concerning this exhortation that we are bringing uh, this morning. So let's go to slide number two and uh, read the text that we have here. And the New Living Translation reads, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. So and then if you look just below, you see the message says, God is strong and he wants you strong. Amen? It's the same thing. When it says, be strong in the Lord, that's a command. If God commands you to be strong, it's right to say he wants you strong. Is that right? So why, why God wants you strong? We can look at different reasons. First of all, he saved us, and we have become his representative. And, and Corinthians, it says, we are ambassador of Christ. So we have to be strong. We are an ambassador, a representative. What people see of me is a reflection of my faith in the Lord God. It says, God is powerful, but I live like a miserable, weak, defeated life. It doesn't mix together. So uh, I'm not talking about arrogance. I'm talking about strength of characters, of values, of living out what we see that we believe. So that the, the people see the Christian church. People are good, and they are walking straight, and they know what they have. They're, there's a hopeful people, a, a people of joy, people of strength. Do you believe that? Do you agree with me this morning? So this is important. So another reason why God wants you strong. Think of everything that he has done for you, not only to, to save you and all of this, but after you got saved, what he has invested in you, the growth, the power of the Holy Spirit, the promises of God. And if, uh, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, he has blessed us, the Father has blessed us of all sorts of spiritual blessings, the heavenlies and Christ. Wow, that's great. And Peter says, we have received everything that pertains to life and godliness. By his uh, amazing promises, we have received uh, the divine nature. That, that's to me, this is hard to explain and to understand, that I have received a, a divine nature, you see? But these are tremendous privilege. So if God has invested that much in you, you can imagine what is his expectation. Well, what God expects of you, if he has given you so much, he made you strong in all this. Amen? It's like the coach of a sports team, okay? He sees that you have the potential. Maybe you are a very fast runner without even being trained. And then he says, I want you in my team, and I will train you, and you, you can make it for the Olympics. Okay, you are in your secondary school, and you're just this little guy there, or girl, and then somebody believes in you, then he takes you under his wings, and he trains you, your, your diet, and your exercise, and you know, all the strength that you are doing, and then you become to compete, and then you win the school championship, and then you, will, you win the city championship, and then you went to the province championship, and then you, you go on to represent your, your country in some national events, or in international events and then you're going to the Olympics so what do you think this coach see in you what is his expectation you're my guy you're my girl like you can do it you know notice and how much more the Lord and his perfection and in his total love and unfailing love to you sees 
what he can do with you, the potential of your life, what, what God can do with you if you submit yourself into his hand. So God wants you strong. strong. Amen? Turn to your neighbor and say, God wants you strong. God wants you strong. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. Wow, it's so good to see so many strong men and women of God here in this church. Hallelujah. Then if you look to verse 11, we will see uh, something a little bit more. Maybe why? Another reason. And the context here says, put on all of God's armor. And then the, the message says, so take everything the master has set for you, well-made weapons of the best materials, and put them to use. And you see a reason here. So that you will be able to stand up to everything the devil throws your way. Stand up against the devil's schemes, his tricks. What are the goals of the devil? I received a WhatsApp last week or the week before. Someone asked me, what happened to a Christian who commits suicide? Oh, that's quite a serious question. How do you answer that? So I didn't answer the same night I received it. Took a time to pray and wait upon the Lord. And the next morning, I think the Lord led me. So I says, I know, uh, I hope you are not thinking of it yourself. That's my first part. Second part is like, I think you already know the answer to that. But let me ask you a question that may help you answer your question. What do you think are the goals of the devil to deceive and lie to people to commit suicide? Then I quoted John 10.10. I says, personally, I choose the abundant life. I hope that's what you will choose. That's how I started. Uh, that's how I answered. So what are the goals of the devil? Because this is what we read. Be strong. Why? Because you have to stand to somebody that is very special, that is very dangerous. You know, sometimes you will see on Facebook or read or hear sermons where people laugh at the devil. Like, you know, they, they're making fun and they are making gestures and, you know, mocking like the devil. Yeah, because they, they want to make a point that they are strong and that God gave them victory. I understand that. But you cannot just, you know, laugh or minimize. Because you even see in the New Testament that the angel Michael did not you know, belittle the devil or, you know, use uh, offensive language. We don't use offensive language because the devil is active. He is ferocious. He looks whom he will devour and he devour people. He is devouring the world. He's seducing the whole world. He is angry and his goal is to destroy everything he can destroy and turn away from God anybody that he can. And he knows the weaknesses because if you combine this thought about how the devil is, tr is, is goals with what James talks about us. When someone is tempted, we were talking about that this uh, Friday with the French uh, Bible study. When someone is tempted, it's not God tempting, but we are tempted by our evil desire, or lust, or greed, or, or areas of weakness in our flesh. So this is what starts the process of sinning. The devil knows these areas of weaknesses in our flesh. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is? Okay, this is us. This is what is talking about us. We are weak with our dual nature. The, the, the spirit and the flesh have opposite effects and functions and desire. Okay, the, the, the flesh wants something to make the flesh feel good. 
even sinfulness and in ugliness and unrighteousness and the spirit says no to that so we are weak and the devil knows we are weak so he uses the areas of our weaknesses to destroy to kill is he able to destroy and kill Yes, he is able. Do, how do we know? Just look at the newspaper. Look be, besides you. You hear all the horror stories of what he, he can do. A mother will find her teenager uh, who, who hang himself in and, and, and his bedroom. And other things, you know, something else. A father will kill all of his children and commit suicide himself after that. Uh, you have, you, the prisons are filled of how the devil can destroy life. And many people, you would be surprised, who have been destroyed in prisons or whatever, may have been raised in Christian families. They may have had religion in their life in the past. And they may have done good things in the past. And at some point, this ferocious enemies just come and takes it all away. There's no uh, absolute prevention Okay, you just push on the button and then you are like all and nobody can touch you because of our flesh. Because sometimes we invite. That's why it says do not give the devil a foothold. Don't open the door. Don't crack the door. Don't let him come in because he will not go out. You know? So here we says so that you can stand up against all the kind of evil tricks that the enemy can bring to you. And he can bring some. Or stand up to, against, uh, stand, stand up to everything the devils can throw at you. So that's why it says, be strong. Okay? So it doesn't only, God doesn't only say, be strong. He gives, he gives us how to be strong. Amen? Hallelujah, still with me? Yes. You know, my, my daughter Sarah, here in Hong Kong, which was mo one of the most godly women in our family. Active, uh, reaching out. She was leading, uh, not leading, but the piano here in church. Uh, she was evangelizing in school. She went to CIS, Christian International School, and she was on the worship team. Uh, you know, like she, she's been after graduation, uh, she, we thought she was too young to send her back to Canada. So we, we said, okay, why don't you go and learn Chinese? So she went to Guangzhou and I had a university where I had many Christian friends, Chinese Christian friends, who were English teachers in this university. So I felt that she was safe there. So she went there, she evangelized. She started her own fellowship after the first semester. I, t I told her, I says, know, know your turfs first. Don't, don't give tracks when you come because you will be watched. But I says, wait after the first semester, then you will know how to, to move. And she joined some other fellowship there. But after that, she started her own fellowship and she reached out to many students. She baptized many students and she left behind, when she left this university, she left behind a fellowship fully established to someone else that was there. So she, that's the, the kind of, of girl that, that she, she, uh, she has been. So when she went to Canada, she went to Montreal, she studied at McGill University, everything was fine. She joined the fellowship, and most of them were Chinese students, There's a lot of Chinese students, Christian students, because she came from Hong Kong, so she still felt like she was in Hong Kong when she was in Montreal, and uh, she was with all this. Then she moved to another university in Ontario to do a master's degree. And when she was there, she was very isolated, and she met this guy, he's very smart, nice, nice looking, and she was very attracted to this guy. But this guy was not a Christian, uh, had some sorts of religious concept, but, and through their conversation, he questioned her faith a lot. He led her to question her faith. She almost come to a place of abandoning of not believing anymore. And sometimes we were quite nervous at that time when we were talking to her. She would say something like, you know, the, the reason why I was doing these things, like in Guangzhou and everything, it's because my father is a pastor. Uh, it's because I was raised in a Christian family. It was not my faith. I was following your faith. Like, you know, like she was, you know, getting confused at that point. But the, the story has a good ending. She did not lose her faith, but she was really near 
at some point, you know, because of, of that. And the devil can use different things. And some others, they walk away. A lot of young people very well to do in the church, involved in the church and the youth group, when they go away to the next province or the next state and university or the next country, and they meet these arrogant enemy of the faith that call themselves philosophy teachers, and they are exposed to that and all this. Uh, many of you have seen, or maybe not, the movie God's Not Dead, that it was shown to the youth here. Such a powerful movie, but that, that is reflecting a, a true story of many of the ungodly teachers. You know, philosophy is not there to destroy faith. Philosophy is supposed to be true philosophy, to be Helping people to question themselves, and then this questioning, finding the truth. But many of the teachers, they are mature, they are well-educated, they know their, their materials, because they are teachers, they have been teaching the same class for, I don't know, 20 years. And then this young guy, 17 years old, doesn't know life, doesn't know anything, has always been in the youth group, he's, even though he's, he knows the Bible and has good parents, he's no match for this philosophy teacher who is enraged and, and, and his goal is to destroy the fate of all the young people that comes. That is not what philosophy is, but that is what many of the color philosophy teachers are doing. So w when we face this, we see that the devil is, is able to destroy a lot of young lives like this. So be strong in the Lord. And so many parents we, we go through hardship, a child who get cancer, uh, that discouragement, if God is so good, why is my child having this, these things like this and I'm not believing anymore? Or, or uh, th there's an affair in the family and th there's discouragement, or there's alcohol in the house, or whatever it is. And discouragement, you know, whatever the devil can throw at people to destroy lives. He will do. So if, you, if someone is not strong in the Lord, and when I say strong in the Lord, it don't mean to be strong today. To, to be strong in the Lord is an ongoing being strong in the Lord. It has to. Because being strong today, victorious today, what about in five years when you will meet this horrible tragedy or uh, something in the position or something that will question you or whatever happens? In five years, we, uh, will, will you still be strong then? You have been strong now, will you be strong then? So that's why the, the, the word says, be strong and the Lord and in the mighty power of the Lord. Amen? Amen? So that we can withstand, that we can stand up against anything that the devil uh, gets uh, into us. Uh, let's go to slide number three. Verse 12. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood. We have a different fight. This is, this is different. And if you look at the message, it says, this is no afternoon athletic contest. And this is good to, to, to see it in this way. Our fight is not to be compared like a competition, a wrestling match, a boxing match, uh, in a school afternoon or in a competition. Because if you belong to the athletic team of your, of your, of your uh, school, and then you, you play against the, 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 the school at the other side of town, whether you win or lose, it doesn't make a big difference. Maybe you will be sad, maybe you will be angry because your team lost or you know, you've been defeated, you were expecting because there's always a, some kind of a spirit of competitions in young people. But that's not a big deal. Your life is not over. You can continue your studies and everything. See, so it says, this is not like afternoon athletic context that you can walk away and forget about. The fight that we are in is an ongoing fight. And it is, this is for keeps a life or death fight to finish against the devil and against his angels. So it's not like just something you can just compete, turn away, go to other activities. If you lost that battle, you, lost, you, lose, your, you lose your life. It's not like losing a competition. So, amen? So this is a very serious fight. And the devil is the worst bully that you cannot imagine. If you can imagine what bully can be, amen. Hallelujah. Slide number four. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13. You know, when the Bible starts with therefore, 
there's always something uh, wonderful coming next. It precedes something important like an instruction, an application. Therefore, watch out. Something's coming, so it's something you can do. And it will answer like, okay, God wants me to be strong, but how, how can I be strong? How can I become of, uh, equipped with the kind of strength and training that I will be able to withstand and continue this ongoing fight, life or death fight, against a more powerful enemy that I am? So that's his, so it says, put on every piece of God's armor. So does it say, put on the piece you like, the piece you prefer, uh, the piece that is more convenient, or the piece that you think will be the most helpful? Because also we, we, we deceive ourselves also and sometimes, oh, I'm strong in the word. Oh, I'm strong in, in prayer. Oh, I, I, I've been a Christian a long time. I'm pretty strong. My, my values are solid. So that, that's enough. I can withstand. But it says here, put on every piece. And then there will be a presentation of, of what happened. And then again, it's, there's a repeat. So you will be able to resist the enemy. It, it, this is repeated over and over and over through this text. It's against the enemy, and he is powerful and everything. If you look at the message, you will find another a dimension added to that. Be prepared. You are up against far more than you can handle on your own. And that, that's the point that I want to, to bring to you this morning. So if you are not strong, in the Lord and in the power of his might, the power of the devil, this fierce enemy, this ferocious enemies, is far more than we can handle. We have no idea what he is capable of. Amen? We have some ideas because we have the word of God and we see this. But when it comes to you at the moment of temptation, the moment of testing, the moment of trials, what he can bring to us and how he can lie to us and how he can influence our minds, don't forget that he is the father of lies. He's the greatest liar ever, the de greatest deceiver. So we are up against far more than we can handle. Take all the help you can get, every weapon God has issued, so that when it's all over but the shouting, you will still be on your feet. Amen? Amen. So you, you have to, to, be, to be careful. Take all the help. Carry every piece of the armor. Let's look at the armor and the next, the next slide. So you have the armor of God. I think we are quite familiar with that because we have, this is a text that we, we are not stranger with. The belt of truth. We need to know what we believe. Okay, this is said in many, many ways in the Word of God. The body armor of righteousness. There's no guilt. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. You know, uh, and John, we were reading that Friday afternoon in the Bible study. Um, if there's nothing, um, I'll, I'll, the, the Bible said that, uh, nothing that we regret, like uh, we, we have assurance in the Lord because we have nothing to take this assurance away. And this is the breast, uh, the, the body armor, the shoes. There's a zeal here. There's a peace of the gospel. There's a, a, a desire to be an ambassador and to bring that message of peace. You know, Christians, we are called to be active. We are called to, to follow. The, the last commandment of the Lord is bring the good news. You, you have received the good news, so carry the good news. The helmet of salvation, this is our ad identity, our assurance. This is the sword of the Spirit. Wow, we need to be so skillful in the Word of God. Amen? And the, and the message says, these tools or these parts of the body armor are more than words. They are more than just symbolic things. It says, learn to apply them. If you look at the next slide, you will see it in the bottom of the page. Learn how to apply them. You will need them throughout your life. God's word is an indispensable weapon. Amen? So the God's word, we know that it's never repeated enough. God's word is an indispensable weapon.
In my years in the ministry, I said it often, and I will say it again. When you meet someone who is a backslidden, who have been uh, following the Lord and are not today, ask the questions, look at the, the process, and at some point they stop reading the Word of God. This is one of the first steps a decline, uh, a, go a going away, a departing from the Word of God, you will see it's in every one of them. This is one of the things that will go, uh, that will go first. In the same way, next slide, verse slide 7, verse 18. In the same way, prayer is essential in an ongoing warfare. Pray hard and long. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirit up. If you go to the top of the pages, pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert. Be persistent in your prayers for all believers. But if you look at the down, down below, prayer is essential and then ongoing. Again, the word of ongoing. But in this text, you have also a, another dimension that is very important and many times overlooked. It's the community, the importance of the community of believers, the church, the coming to church, the joining for the young people, joining the youth group. It's vital to create this unity, this spiritual unity. The church makes a big difference. For those of you that we are regular, we, we come to church every Sundays. We don't realize it because we are here every Sunday, what it does to us. You flow with what the Spirit speaks to the church. You, you, you follow the vision. You follow the example of the pastors. You follow what the church as, as a whole. We are going to the mission projects, the generosity. We are growing. We are developing. We are influencing each other. And we become, we, each church has its own personality in a way. We, we become unique in, in a way. We are lighthouse. We are different than that church or that church. They have their own qualities. They have their own personalities. But we are what we are. But by being here, we, we discover that. We become part of it. We grow into it. And we strengthen one another. Okay? So that's important. But for those who are irregular and they are not coming, they don't know that. And they are missing out. And it's very hard. Those who are, okay, in, in a church, you have um, d different circles of, of membership. You have the core group. The ones who are always active, they are doing everything. Like it's the five person of the church. And then around this five person, you have another 10 to 15 person. They are there. You can count on them. They are faithful. They are always there. But they are not as active as the five person. And then you, you, you have a, 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 a bigger circle, the ones who, who sit and watch and attend. They like it, but they're not doing anything. So they will never be criticized because they're not doing anything. And then you have others who are there, not there. They jump from this church to that church. There's a conference there, there's over there. So you cannot really count on them. Sometimes they will say, I will be there. But they don't show up. This is, uh, this is an, an, another group of people. But here, here it, we see the importance of the community of believers and being strong in the Lord. It's very important. Sometimes I feel, because I feel that the, either the messages or, or the series of messages of what the Lord has been doing in the last few months is awesome. But then sometimes I think to different individuals, as they were not there. They, did, they didn't get it. They didn't hear it. They cannot rejoice about what God has been doing, the reports that have been given. So here you, you read, pray hard and long. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep each other's up, spirits up, so that no one falls behind or drops out. And that is the power of the Word of God, the, 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 the team, the community of believers, the importance of being part of the church. Being there, but not only being there, being part of the prayer for one another. And the WhatsApp group this morning went, team, 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 after Pastor Jennifer's message was sick, so that the phone didn't uh, stop uh, ringing. Hallelujah. And it's, it, it's, it's really good. So that no one will fall behind. 
and and be left or to to, to die and and go because that's what the devil do, do if he can get one to to drag behind and to wait behind then he will he knows i can get to that one he's not part of the sheepfold anymore he's not protected he doesn't have his brothers he's criticizing he's confused he's alone he has more ungodly friends than he has godly friends i can get to that one and i can destroy uh, this one amen? amen hallelujah so on Friday night, we had an illustration for the young people that I will share with you in the next slide. It's about Captain America. <laughs> you know Captain America. How many of you have seen the movie? It's a great movie. It's a great movie. Hallelujah. Captain America is a very nice guy. Has good values. And, you know, it's a good fighter too. So it's, you know, for guys, it's a movie for guys more, but it's good. But you see, there's a difference between Captain America then and Cap before Captain America. <laughs> Steve Rogers, good values. He wanted to fight, wanted to make a difference, wanted to go against Hitler and all the invasion of Europe. And he wanted, and he kept on registering his name to go in the military, but was always rejected because you can, you can know why. <laughs> and w one time in the movie, he says, Rejected says, why? Because I'm saving your life. <laughs> okay. And then, whatever, because he had good values, you know, one time, and the one doctor noticed him because of his values, not because of his physical strength. And there was a secret serum. So if you get this secret serum in him, everything that is good in him will become better. You know, isn't that great? You know, whatever is good in you, what God is doing in you, will become better because of the Holy Spirit's superpower, okay? So finally, they sent him to the military training, and one time they threw a grenade down. Grenade! And then he's the only one, he threw himself over the grenade to save. He didn't think about his own life. He threw himself over the grenade so that all the people, the, all the other soldiers in the training would have this saved life. He's the only one who did that. The other ones ah, ran, ran away and he, he protected them. So anyway, he was chosen to become a super soldier. So he went to this machine where they injected him and everything. Lots of buttons and flash, you know, and everything. And then he ends up being Captain America. Isn't that great? How many of us, we feel like Steve Rogers? Seriously, we, we feel like Steve Rogers. This is what we are, this is who we are. We are just ordinary. I remember before I stepped into the mission field, being a Christian, I was reading biographies. Again, I insist, please read biographies of Christian heroes. Find some inspiration in these things. You see, I have uh, Jonathan Goforth, an open door in China, the greatest revivalist, little farm boy from the farm, poor. First time he went to the city, his mother had to make him a suit. And he was laughed at because he was so poor. He goes to the city, but his suit is like, you can tell it's made by hand by the farm mother, you know, whatever. And then he became such a great man of God. When he started to go to Bible school, he was serious, committed, started to reach out to the prostitutes, to downtown, the poor. And the other students in the Bible school laughed at him. Why do you think you're so zealous, you know? And, but he went and changed China. He brought the greatest revival. Tens of thousands of people were saved after the others. When the big revival of Korea came, he, he went there, he received the power, the Holy Spirit came back to China. It's an incredible story. So when you read something like that, you see. I felt like that. When I was reading these, these missionary biographies, I was, I was jealous. Because me, who am I? I'm just, I come from this little village, so insignificant, you know, uh, poor, farms, background, not a lot of education, you know, and everything. So how can this happen? I was Christian, but I could not see that God can do some things with me. It's for American. It's for British. 
It's for, uh, you know, these great men of God, they, they, they have reached to that level, but not, not me. So we think of ourselves like we are Steve Rogers, but what you and I need, we need to get in the machine. <laughs> we need to get the serum. Amen? That's why it says, <laughs> and his mighty power. The power to fight against the devil, to withstand, and to, to be strong in our ongoing fight for life and death is the keys and the power of the mighty God. This is a quote from the movie. Why me? Says Steve Rogers. Because when he was in the, in the, in the machine, he talked to the doctor, so why me? And the doctor says, because a weak man knows the value of strength and the value of power. It's not me. It's God. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's stand and pray. Praise God.